It's a pleasure to talk to all of you and actually an honor because uh, I'm an OBGYN physician uh, and uh, have been here since 1986. But in women's health care, I did a lot of hormone replacement therapy and kind of specialized in that. And then when we got to doing that, especially, I found out if uh, you can get the hormones right, but if you don't get the nutrition right, you're not going to solve the problems. And the nutrition is the uh, real key. I also uh, am a grass farmer, and uh, I speak to farm conferences. It's, oh, you want to bring that? Let's see. That's why it's called the fatted calf, because uh, that's what those guys are interested in making, is fatted calves. And we know uh, uh, the fatted calf uh, provides everything you need to stay healthy. And we'll talk about that at, at the end. And also, uh, y'all are, are in a position of great power to influence the health of your flock, your parishioners, your church members. And I want to give you some information to help you uh, do that because you have a tool at your disposal, that is the most powerful thing, one of the most powerful things you can do to heal people. And we'll talk about that as we uh, go along. Okay? And we'll do questions. If you want to stop me, ask questions anytime, or we'll certainly have questions uh, afterwards. Okay? All right, let's see. Oh, got to remember to point back. Start with just a little proverb, basically. Uh, it's a superior doctor prevents, doc, prevents sickness, the mediocre doctor attends to impending sickness, and the inferior doctor treats sickness. This is right the opposite orientation of American medicine. We just treat sick people, you know, and uh, it is changing. This is actually a really exciting time because all of medicine is changing, and you don't know about it yet. Uh, it's in the in the medical literature, it's in the science, but changing the organizations and what everyone does is really difficult. It takes years for something that medicine we know. Poor old Dr. Marshall, there's a Dr. Marshall in Australia who uh, discovered that ulcers were caused by a bacteria, Helobacter. Y'all probably all know about it now. People get checked for Helobacter all the time now. He discovered this in the early 80s, published all of this, and it was still 95, 15 years before people started believing it and not calling him a quack. He even took Helobacter to give himself an ulcer and prove it, <laughs> which he did. So it takes years for things to get through. And what's going through right now are ways to, uh, we know how to cure cancer, we know how to reverse Alzheimer's, and we know how to uh, put diabetes in remission. And you're going to learn that today. And it may be another 10 years before people get to uh, actually using these things. So first of all, we're going to do a little bit of a history lesson because I'd like to start with this to, because, uh, you know, a hundred year, years ago, uh, things were totally different as we developed our modern food and nutrition. Before 1920, the idea of an acute heart attack simply uh, didn't exist. It was such a rare event, rarely reported. Paul Dudley White is the, uh, known as the father of cardiology. He was Dwight Eisenhower's doctor. Uh, and uh, when Ike had a heart attack in the White House in 1955, and he wrote the textbook on heart disease at Harvard. Uh, but the bottom one I think is pretty, he graduated from medical school in 1911 and never heard of acute coronary thrombosis. In his memoirs, he talks about that he practiced at Harvard from 1920 to 1927 before he saw his first heart attack. Diabetes. This is from a report in the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, or the Archives of Internal Medicine, 1924, from the Health Commissioner of New York when they had a, a crisis with the amount of diabetes that they had. They had, uh, in 1880, there were three diabetics per 100,000 people in New York City, and it had rose to 20 per 100,000, which was considered a major problem or a crisis or an epidemic. Uh, and for you who live here in the Shoals, uh, in the Shoals, there are roughly 200,000 people in our medical service area, and there are 14,300 diabetics per 100,000 people. That's a little bit of a change. Okay. So these 
problems we created with our nutrition. And when the, the government and everything got involved in it, what usually happens, it got a whole lot worse. You know, we come out in 1980 with the, the uh, low-fat diet, and this is a quote from a testimony before Congress by Dr. Philip Handler, who was chairman of Food and Nutrition Board, National Academy of Sciences, and you can read it, but basically to recommend this low-fat diet is not based on science, it's just a vast experiment you're going to put 300 million Americans through. So let's see how that experiment turned out. We'll talk about obesity here, because it's to do. So this is the obesity rates in the United States by 1985. Uh, the dark blue states were greater than 10%. The white states uh, were actually states where they didn't keep the statistics because they didn't think it was a big enough problem to bother spending money to gather statistics. And then in 87, it looked like this. In 89, it looked like this. 90, it looked like this. We've got states coming in above 15%. 93, uh, 95, 97, 99. We'll keep going. 2001, we got Mississippi leading the way at 20, greater than 25% obesity. Uh, 2005, 2007, 2010, above 30% in the dark red. I've added a new one since I was here the last time. That was 2014. Uh, with greater than 35% uh, obesity. Until we like this funny picture. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what God created, and this is what uh, our uh, industrial food supply, government, and medical science created. Okay? And I'd like you to, uh, when you go through this, if we, if we just went back real fast, if some of y'all are like me and uh, science fiction fans, this looks like a scene from a science fiction movie when the mutated virus escapes from the lab and shows how it spreads across the uh, country. Okay? So this isn't evolution. This isn't anything. It's an exposure. It's a toxin. It's exposure just like it is to a virus in the science fiction movies. The picture you see there is exposure. And that's what we want to learn about first, is what that exposure is and what has really amplified all of these problems. I call these the four foods of the apocalypse, because we do have an apocalypse coming on this and the number of people that are sick. It's apocalypse for our healthcare system. Now, uh, alcohol, you know about, we're not going to talk about that. I, and I don't have time to talk about acellular carbohydrates, refined flours with the little thing of Roundup there, but I, just as an aside, Roundup's in all of our <laughs> flour or soybean oil. You know, they harvest soybeans by spraying with Roundup. And, up. and what the science is showing is Roundup, and some people believe it's caused a cancer in there, and DuPont or whoever's in a big fight about that, but what it does do that we do know is uh, Roundup disrupts your gut epithelium and allows proteins in, and so it'll tell you a little bit about, you know, gluten sensitivity. I grew up, you know, I was born in 55, so I grew up in the 60s, 70s. I don't know if anybody was gluten sensitive or all this gluten and all these food sensitivities and all this stuff. But if you track those and put them in track with, gluten, with the Roundup use, they go hand in hand. But back to the two main offers. And the first one, uh, the trans fats, we introduced uh, in 1911. Crisco was first introduced. The original form was about 45% trans fat. Uh, and the government's recognized trans fats as a problem now. I just wanted to give caution. They're banning trans fats, but they really should ban vegetable oils and all these uh, other oils that we manufactured in an industrial process starting around, well, corn oil was first made in 1907, and they put it in the cattle feed uh, to enhance it, and it killed the cows, which really does not make farmers happy. Thing. So we figure, well, what are we going to do with all of it? So we'll feed it to humans. But the polyunsaturated, the overconsumption of the polyunsaturated fats creates inflammation. Uh, they oxidize in your bloodstream, chlorine oxidized cholesterol, which your body mistakes for infection. So the overconsumption of the vegetable oils is a, a source of inflammation. The trans fats, the government knows about, they're banning. I just wanted to uh, talk to you about the healthy fats you do need to eat and the replacement for trans fats is a thing called interesterified fats you'll start seeing on labels. So 
uh, I would avoid it also and use uh, healthy oils, which would be coconut oil. The healthiest oil you could probably you could possibly lose here in the South is uh, lard, pig lard. It's about the perfect balance for humans. That's why your grandparents used it for everything because it was the healthiest thing they could eat. It's about 35%. Well, a pastured pig like we raise is about 35% saturated fat and 50% monounsaturated fat and only 15 to 20% polyunsaturated fat. And that's about the uh, natural blend. But I won't spend a lot of time on these oils since the government is uh, getting trans fats out and that's going to uh, change. What we really want to talk about for an extended period of time, which is really the, the uh, devil in all of this, is sugar. Okay? And let me explain about sugar, because the term sugar is used, I don't know, there's 80 different ways they put sugar into uh, processed food, but basically table sugar is called sucrose. It is made up of one molecule of fructose and one molecule of glucose. And you look and see, this is glucose, this is what your body burns for fuel. Every cell in your body can burn glucose. Fructose is a plant sugar. Uh, it's a, you can tell the difference, it's a five carbon ring versus a six carbon ring. But all the natural sweeteners are going to be uh, fructose and glucose locked together. Okay? And it turns out fructose is a toxic poison to humans, like alcohol. In small amounts, like nature packs it in fresh fruit with fiber, your liver is capable of detoxifying that amount of poison and you can uh, remain healthy just as, you know, they tell you, you know, a glass of red wine tonight lowers your risk of heart disease, but three bottles of Jack Daniels really is not going to do you any good. And you understand that quite clearly. The only difference, though, in fructose and uh, alcohol is your brain metabolizes alcohol, so you get drunk. That gives you somewhat of a limit on how much you take in. Not for everyone, but for most people. And uh, there is no limit to taking in fructose because your brain can't sense it except it is the part that's really sweet and really addicting and, uh, and, and really good. But your liver doesn't notice a difference. It metabolizes fructose in a almost exactly, but not exactly similar way as it metabolizes alcohol. So those with children, and I'm not the one that originated this statement, but you can give your child a glass of apple juice or you can give them a shot of Jack Daniels. There's no difference as far as their liver is concerned. And this is the real problem with children we'll talk about in a minute. So for all y'all who miss high school biology, like to see it, I'll put it up there, but I'll just explain to you exactly what it means. It's the metabolism of fructose in liver, which I said I got one for alcohol too, and they're very similar, but basically the bottom line is this. Fructose goes to your liver. It is a toxin. No cell in your body can metabolize it. Your liver is going to metabolize it into triglycerides and fatty acids, small dense LDL cholesterol. Cholesterol, total cholesterol number is totally useless as far as your health. What really matters are your particle size of your bad cholesterol. And there are five different bad cholesterols, or five different LDLs, and they range from small dense to large fluffy. Large fluffy is uh, not very atherogenic, not very, cause very problems, but small dense is the one that really causes, and fructose is metabolized into the small dense LDL cholesterol. This is the thing that gets the plaque and the heart disease going. So fructose causes the heart disease because your liver turns it into the bad types of fat. When you eat that pig lard, which the good Lord made for you for thousands and thousands of years, you may elevate your cholesterol, but you elevate your large fluffy particles, which aren't atherogenic, or at least minimally so. So, just to give you an idea of the sugar consumption and what it's created and why I said there's a, a tsunami coming for health care and it really doesn't matter what they do about Obamacare or anything else, these are the grim numbers from just a few years ago. 30%, if we take 30% of people that are obese or overweight, 80% over, uh, of them are going to be metabolically damaged. Basically, they have liver disease from consumption, overconsumption of sugar, which gives you 57 million. But here's the kicker. Everybody talks about, oh, these overweight people, if they just, you know, eat less and exercise more, we wouldn't have all these problems. But look at the normal weight people. 
40% of them are, have metabolic liver damage already. They just don't accumulate the fat to show it. They usually accumulate it on the inside or they accumulate it in their liver, which gives 67 million of them sick. So we've got 124 million sick people in America right now. And as they get sicker and need health care, it is just going to overwhelm the system. And that's why I tell you it's a tsunami coming that we know about. But the good news is we, we know how to fix it. Whether we have the willpower to do so, we'll see. So first I was wanted to talk a little bit about uh, healthy diets traditionally. And we learned the best information way back in the 1930s from this guy named Weston A. Price, who was a dentist. He was concerned about diseases. His main concern was cavities because uh, he's one of the founders of the research arm of the American Dental Association. And after World War I, uh, the dentition, the cavities in the recruits was so bad that it was considered a matter of national security. So he basically devoted his life to trying to figure out where cavities come from. And they spent years studying infections and this kind of stuff. By the 1930s, though, he knew it was something in nutrition because he was trained as an anthropologist, too, and he knew that uh, primitive peoples, traditional peoples, don't get cavities. If you go to the Indian mounds and dig up skulls, you're going to see, and you've seen these pictures yourself all the time, these beautiful perfect teeth in perfect alignment, less than 1% of what they dig up has uh, any cavities in it. So he started this project in 1930 to travel the world and visit indigenous people still on their traditional diets. And uh, then published his work, which was the textbook Nutrition uh, at Harvard for years. In 1939, I think it was. So. And what he found were these things. Those are the Vero brothers that he used, one doctor uses in his demonstration of these three fat-soluble vitamins. One of the key regulators of genes and key health are the three fat-soluble vitamins you get from healthy animal fats, primarily. The vitamins A, D, and K2. And those are the vitamins that uh, all of you should take, whether you do cod liver oil, vitamin D. Those are the vitamins that, especially in the modern fine diet, are very hard to get, K2 being the uh, uh, one that's most deficient. So give you a little story about how these work. Uh, vitamin A upregulates cell production. So let's take your immune cells for action. Vitamin A, which, you know, the government allows them to call beta carotene from carrots vitamin A, and it, it's two vitamin A molecules stuck together that has to be cleaved, and absorption can be erratic and get it so from traditional people's got it from the liver or cod liver oil that's been used for thousands of years, but it increases the number of immune cells you have available to fight infection. Vitamin D is not really a vitamin. It is a hormone made in your skin. It's a gene regulator. It goes in and regulates genes. As I tell my patients, you know, we're all supposed to be living in the Garden of Eden, frolicking around naked and enjoying life. But, you know, we had that incident with the serpent and the apple and everything got messed up. You know, so frolic around naked in Alabama doesn't go over well. I don't know about Florida and other places, but don't try it here. So we don't get enough vitamin D and we have to get it from our food. It goes into immune cells. It turns on a gene that makes a protein called the matrix GLA protein. That protein's job is to repair your blood vessels or soft tissues actually all over your body. One of the things when you're repairing injury to your blood vessels is uh, you would prefer not to put calcium in that repair like when you're fixing a broken bone. You would like a lot of calcium in that repair. Vitamin K2 is the master of calcium everywhere in your body. It basically tells the matrix GLA protein not to put calcium in your blood vessels so you don't get hardening of the arteries. You get vitamin K2 from basically only two sources, uh, grass-fed, pastured beef. Cow eats green leafy things in their gut or bacteria that converts K2, K1, which is in green leafy things, and all of you know K1, it regulates the proteins that clot your blood. That's why they tell grandma on her cumina, don't eat your turnip greens because it messes up your balance. On a cow's eating those greens, and it's gutter these bacteria that ferment K1 into K2, and then K2's in the milk, the cheese, the uh, beef fat that we eat. Any pastured animal will do that. Chickens do that when they're, when they're out in grass, and that's why we have the 
organic farm like we do, when they eat green leafy things and they've been out on that pasture, you can see it in that dark orange yolk, has a lot of K2 in it. The other place you get it are the traditional things we used to do, uh, fermented vegetables. If you take green leafy things and ferment them in a pot, like Grandma used to have that pot of raw sauerkraut there making for you, all these things Grandma used to do have meaning and reason. And you would get K2, but the modern American diet removes most K2. They don't make the standard sauerkraut's not made in the traditional way, and we don't get the fermented vegetables like, like we used to. So those people, highly, there were three things he found about all these groups. And it's interesting, the first place he went was to the Loschenthal Valley of Switzerland, because uh, he had a really nice, there was a community in that high alpine valley that you had to backpack two days to get to. About 2,000 people that lived there for 1,000 years, they had a Catholic church, and they lived off the land. They had cattle and, uh, uh, of course, obviously chickens and all those kinds of things, and they grew one type of rye. But he found these things to be uh, traditional with all of these groups he went to, 14 different ones around the world. If they uh, had was one, they all highly prized animal fats, just like your grandparents did, their lard and that type of thing. And that's because they would have get, you know, those naturally raised animal fats had the vitamins A, D, and K2. Uh, they all had, uh, if they had grains to eat, and there are no healthy whole grains, they have to be treated just like it says in Ezekiel, I think it's 4 9. If they had grains to eat, they all had an elaborate process for treating the grains, sprouting and fermenting, because grains contain things that inhibit their absorption, inhibit absorption of other minerals from you, so that's why you have those frozen breads, Ezekiel brand, and, and that in the store. I don't eat bread grains anymore, and you'll see why in a minute, but if I did, it would be sprouted grain bread, like the Bible told you to do it, because there's a reason for that uh, stress. And the third thing was they always kept... Uh, they always had a sacred food they kept for children and uh, pregnant women, and sometimes couples. And in the Loschendal Valley, it's interesting, their sacred food was the, was the butter they made in the early spring, which would have the highest vitamin K2 content. But they put that butter away and stored it for the pregnant women and children because getting healthy babies you know, without health care was vital to the survival. And they actually had a church service in June uh, where they burnt a candle of that butter to thank God for it. So it's an interesting stuff. And if you ever get it, you can get this book online, you can order it. It's just really a fascinating read, especially chapter 15, which summarizes all the different things. So humans, God made us where we could have lots of different uh, foods and be healthy, but sugar's not one of them. This is the granddaughter getting her first taste of really healthy food. Uh, but I wanted to... Uh, since her mother is a holistic nutritional therapist, and we've been into this since she was born, she has what they call a Weston A. Price face. All of the malalignments, the stuff that we have, and the braces and all this is all from malnutrition, not enough vitamins A, D, and K2. And K2 in the bone making, because vitamin uh, D, which you know, turns on the gene that makes a protein called osteocalcin, puts the protein in your bones and teeth from menopausal women, and everyone with osteoporosis are told to you know, take their vitamin D, but vitamin K2 is the one that activates osteocalcin and informs it to put calcium in your bones and teeth. So if your children have cavities uh, and uh, malalignment and have to end up costing you all the money for braces, it's because they didn't get enough vitamins A, D, and K2 when they were babies, when they were growing, thin to the mother and that. So she has the wide faces, and she is, of course, the most beautiful grandchild anyone has ever seen. That's another reason to put her up there. But... All of her teeth are perfectly aligned. I had braces, her mother had braces, you know, because we didn't know these things. You know, because she has the wide face that she's supposed to develop to adequately hold all of her teeth. And of course, she hasn't had any cavities or anything, okay? So now let's get to healthy nutrition that you can do and healing. So I'm going to run through, this is just from time about, but, you know, why they were wrong and what this has done to devastate her health. I'm going to run through just a little bit of science here for you, uh, uh, because the, the snakes made in the 60s about fat, or to understand, but first of all, saturated fat that you all have an aversion for has been demonized. And that was, you know, part of that was the, uh, the edible oil industry that 
sells you margarines and these other things, you know, they had to capture market share, so they had to demonize butter. Lard, they destroyed, you know, lard's gone, you can't get lard, except we make it, but uh, the uh, uh, lard in the store you can still get, but it's partially hydrogenated, which means they put trans fats in it so it can set out on the shelf for a year or two. And that's, as I tell patients, that's so ba bacteria aren't stupid enough to eat it, only people, so you can't really get real lard now. But there's never been any scientific evidence that saturated fat is associated with heart disease. That was from 2010, 347,000 patients, no association with how much egg yolk and butter and thing and saturated fats that they, that they ate. There are actually four of these meta-analyses that involve over about a million and a half patients. So it's something been told, everyone believes, they can't, you can't get it out of the literature. It's even there, it's just still on the American Heart Association saying about to limit saturated fat to 10%, but it's simply not true. And a lot of myths in medicine get established as true, and uh, uh, they're not. Uh, here's the thing that really uh, was confusing years ago, it's confusing people. Saturated fat in your diet has no association with heart disease, but saturated fat in your bloodstream, in small dense LDL cholesterol, is associated with heart disease, and it's associated with uh, diabetes, both of these. But here's the real kicker. The more saturated fat, or the more fat you eat, the lower the saturated fat levels in your bloodstream are, okay? And so it's right the opposite as you would think, and you can see why that may have been confusing in the 60s and 70s, May. So we know now, though, the more carbohydrate you eat, sugar, the more small dense LDL cholesterol you make, the more that's in your bloodstream. Okay? So it's just interesting things. So what we're going to do is talk the rest of the time about the ketogenic diet. And as I told you, you as pastors and church people have a very powerful tool, and that's fasting. Okay? While we can, a lot of churches poo-poo fasting and all this stuff, you know, and you think, hey, you know, I got the impression growing up, well, fasting is to help you meditate and spiritual, but it's not. Fasting is the most powerful thing you can do to heal your body. And what I want you to understand when we get through with all of this is how that is true. And what you're really meant to eat what God designed you to eat to stay healthy. Because all of you, uh, except for a few that are born with genetic defects, are designed to live to be 110 and in perfect health. We're not designed to get diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. And keeping your church people healthy, you know, and doing God's work is a very important thing. And you're going to have a, have a knowledge of that. So those 124 million sick people all need to be on a ketogenic diet. And let me explain what that is and how it heals your body. You're designed like a flex fuel vehicle. If I'm talking to guys, it's a flex fuel truck. If I'm talking to women, it's a flex fuel Lexus or whatever. But it is a flex fuel vehicle. You know, on a flex fuel vehicle, you can flip the switch to do E85 ethanol. You gotta kinda retune the engine a little bit. Or you can switch it back to gasoline, which is really E10% ethanol in most cases. Your body is the same way. All through your body you have all of these genetic switches. Okay? And if you restrict your carbohydrate, that is sugar and starch, enough, all these genetic switches will go off and you will be reprogrammed to primarily burn fat. And that's called keto adaptation. We'll talk about it in a minute. If you eat carbohydrate, then you're in nutritional glucosis, we'll call it. You're primarily burning glucose as your primary fuel source. If you restrict it enough, then you're primarily burning uh, fat for energy. And we define that this fat is broken down in your liver by uh, three, uh, two, uh, three ketone bodies, acetyl, acetone, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And about 90% of it is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And when you look at this, we call it the keto zone, you can measure ketones. And in this, this is a, we're really going to be talking about a medical therapy from here on out. This is really important in some disease controls. 
So your ketones are virtually zero when you're eating starch and stuff all the time. And then when you go into fat or when you go into fasting, and they call it starvation ketosis here, your beta-hydroxybutyrate goes up. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is one of the most powerful healing things known to humans. It is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. What that basically means is histone deacetylase are gene suppressor enzymes. God gave you a set of enzymes, a set of genes in your body that produce internal antioxidants and relieve all of your oxidative stress. And I know you all hear people talking about you need your antioxidants, you need all this. Well, God gave you all of those inside you in your genes. You just turn them off by eating carbohydrate. You know, David was a herder, you know, out there killing those lions for a reason. So when you get down below, on average, 50 grams of carbohydrate a day, which isn't that very much. One baked potato is about 75 grams of carbohydrate. We'll talk about how we do the diet and everything. Then you start burning. You go through this genetic change over a three to four week period, and your body starts burning uh, primarily beta-hydroxybutyrate. It always burns some of both, just like a car can, but you've got to retune it. So you've got to get above about 0.05, and starvation ketosis goes up in the three to five range. It's like any other medicine, the higher it is. So I think when I explain some of these treatments, uh, you'll understand. There is a thing that doctors get confused about called ketoacidosis. This is only in diabetics, certainly type 1, who have zero insulin. And they can't get any sugar in. Their cells are dying, and they're pouring out all this, trying to get the cells to burn the beta-hydroxybutyrate. And this doesn't happen in normal people. And don't let them use it. So first of all, I want to dispel some myths about uh, food and nutrition. This is called the fatted calf because God put everything in the fatted calf you need to stay healthy. If you were stuck on an island just with your cows and you're a cow farmer like me, you're fine. You're going to live your entire life and stay healthy. People don't believe that and people think you've got to eat your fruits and vegetables. But this was proven scientifically way back in the 1920s. That guy is Vilmar Stefansson. Bill Hilmar, I don't know how he says that first name, but he was a Harvard anthropologist. He spent a total of about 15 years living with the Inuit on the ice. And the Inuit, which the Inuit lived, have been living on the ice for over 3,000 years. Uh, obviously, during the winter, they are out on the ice. Uh, everything's frozen, seal being their primary source of nutrition. They basically eat seal. They come onto the land in the summertime to hunt caribou, fish, fish eggs. They never eat any vegetable material at all. Lived in perfect health for 3,000 years. So he comes back in 1917. This is about 1915. He was going off on another expedition. And he's writing, publishing data like all the scientists do. He said about, well, you know, and they were, at that time, that's when they were discovering vitamin C and vitamin A. And they're, oh, everybody, you've got to eat your fruits and vegetables. You've got to have a balanced diet. So he's publishing, hey, I've lived for 15 years on nothing but meat, they called it then, which they meant animal source diet. And I feel great, and I'm in the best health I've ever been. So they got into what we would call today a Twitter fight, okay? Insulting each other and calling one a liar, and he's got to be this. So he came down to, to save his reputation, he agreed to this thing called the Bellevue Experiment. 1928, he and another Arctic explorer were locked in Bellevue Hospital. Not the whole year, but the first four months, under guard and observation, because you know Bellevue Hospital in New York is the psych hospital. Okay? And they thought he was psycho, and so they brought him, you know, fish, meat, all the commercially available animal products there, uh, which included eggs, I think. And uh, so uh, to live, and they bet he would have. Uh, uh, scurvy, which is vitamin C deficiency, about four months. That's why they wanted him locked up for four months. The other guy stayed locked up the whole time. He had a lot of business stuff, but remained on the diet for a year. And of course, at four months, they were perfectly healthy. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, I thought it's somewhere I got it a little further. Uh, we'll go over what they ate in a minute. But basically, any of these diseases can be treated by being in nutritional ketosis or a very high fat, low carbohydrate diet. And we're gonna talk about some of them. 
What they ate on that experiment, we know this, is this gets confused with the meat diet. They used the term meat, but what they meant by meat in 1920 was animal products. So they ate, he ate about 200 grams of fat, which is 1,800 calories, about 115 grams of protein, and uh, less than 10 grams of carbohydrate, because the only carbohydrate he got was from the muscle animals. But to do this and stay healthy, you have to eat the liver, the brain, the bone marrow, the kidneys, things that we don't traditionally do now. So when we do this diet, we get those other nutrients from the above ground, low carbohydrate vegetables like peppers, onion, mushrooms, green beans, asparagus, squash, okra, everything. But the point is, you're designed to live on, on uh, primarily fat. And the reason is your brain is in relation to your body size is huge, and God knew you had to fuel it, and fat has twice as many calories per gram, and fueling your brain is a real challenge uh, in, in your diet, and fat's what you were designed to eat and live on. So, first we'll talk about uh, obesity, get rid of the myths, because this is important, and the thing I feel a lot about is, uh, you have no control over your weight contrary to what you think. How much exercise you get and how many calories you eat has no control, has no effect on your weight. Your weight is programmed into you by your genes through your autonomic nervous system. If you think about it, when you go out there and look at my cows in the summertime when the grass is this high, they eat eight hours straight. They ruminate eight hours straight and uh, they sleep eight hours, a simple life but you don't see any obese, heavy cows. It's controlled, your autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system controls your weight and you're not in control of it. So this, you know, if they just eat less and exercise more, you know, it's a result of poisoning and uh, you don't have any control over it. This is a relief to people who are overweight because they get looked down on. They get assured, you know, you just don't have self-discipline. You're just lazy. And that's really not what it is. As we said earlier, it's an exposure. And I'll tell you how it actually works. The fructose damages your liver, which we've established from the sugar consumption, okay? There are two hormones, four hormones involved in your weight. Ghrelin is just your hunger hormone, and peptide YY is your immediate satisfaction hormone. If you eat in about 50, you know, you think you want seconds and you wait 20 minutes and that's kind of gone, that's peptide YY. But the one that's in control of your long-term weight, not your eating, is two hormones, insulin and leptin. And this is how it works. In your brain stem, there are two monitors. This is your autonomic nervous system. It is in control of your weight. The insulin center is the primary one. So you eat a meal, your insulin spikes. The insulin center sees the spike and knows you just took in a lot of energy. It has to decide what to do with that energy. It looks to the leptin center. If leptin's there, and leptin is your fat cell hormone, primarily your gut fat, comes up there. If leptin's sitting there and saying, hey, this dude's got plenty of fat in his body, he doesn't need any more, the insulin center will up your metabolic rate and burn off the excess fat. It'll inhibit any more insulin secretion. It'll up your metabolic rate and burn off the excess energy. This is why exercise is not helpful. Exercise is excellent for your health. All of you should exercise. I'm not downing exercise. It just doesn't help you lose weight. Because unless you're an Olympic athlete or something like that, your exercise expenditure of energy is less than 20% of what you're expending. Your brain's sucking up 20 to 25% sitting there just doing all the little thinking it's doing all day long. And how much the rest of your body burns in idle is variable. And the insulin center concurrence that variable. So the reason is your energy expenditure, if you believe the calorie is a calorie or you know, your calorie in is a calorie out, that's true, but you're out is variable, and that variable is not under your control. It's under control of that insulin center in your brain stem. So what has happened to cause this obesity thing we saw in all these slides, you know, and all this growing is the overconsumption of sugar, and I'll, I think I've got that. Uh, yeah. The overconsumption of sugar, the fructose, has damaged your liver, and it's caused insulin resistance in your liver. It's producing the fats that give you heart disease, the insulin resistance in your liver is the true thing that's going to give you all these other diseases. 
So your liver's damaged from years of overconsuming sugar. As I said, we were only supposed to sift sugar in uh, a little bit of uh, fresh fruit. It's damaged your liver and your insulin level is chronically high because your liver's damaged. And the way the good Lord made us, there are two times in a woman's life and one time in a man's life when you need to gain weight. Puberty in both and puberty and pregnancy in women. Well, everyone who's been pregnant knows you get checked for diabetes. Okay? So insulin goes up in pregnancy and it blocks the leptin signal. And this is the key to understand that. So damage your liver, your insulin is high, it's blocking your leptin signal. So you have that insulin spike, the insulin center looks to leptin, leptin's sitting there not saying anything, and so it assumes you're starving to death. So it lowers your metabolic rate, it activates your vagus nerve to tell you to pour out a second burst of insulin to store more fat, because insulin has only one message when it's in your bloodstream, and that's store fat. So basically what you see with the obesity epidemic is the liver damage. Now, you say, well, well there's 40% of these skinny people that are normal. The insulin resistance is the key to understanding the variabilities of disease. When your insulin is too high, insulin receptors are going to become resistant. You've all heard talk about the insulin resistance. Well, in some people, the insulin receptors on their fat cells become resistant early on. Usually not in their gut, because this is, this is you know, where I would be, you know, I never had fat here. It's here, because those insulin receptors are, you know, and so, the other thing in those people, their insulin receptors in their blood vessels usually uh, don't become insulin resistant. They're stimulated with the insulin and the glucose to grow and they stiffen in hypertrophy, giving you the high blood pressure that you got. So how your insulin receptors respond to the chronically high insulin level depends on, determines whether you have the weight problem or just the diabetes or just these other uh, diseases. So let's talk about uh, healing this. The ketogenic diet, so if you think about diabetes, and we'll do it first, diabetes, uh, which is, we talked about the rates, it's about 10% nationwide, 10,000 per 100,000, when it was 3 per 100,000 before refined sugar was available to the uh, population. But if you think about diabetes, it's what? You become insulin resistant. You know. Well, when you're eating the fatted calf, you don't need insulin. Fat does not need insulin to be metabolized. So when you're on a very high fat, very low carbohydrate diet, your insulin need goes way down. And in fact, when you put it into practice, and this is a article that was published a couple of years ago by 26 of the top doctors in the world, uh, Beth Gower at UAB, one of their PhD researchers, basically saying every diabetic should be on this diet. This should be their first approach because, you know, 80% of them will get off all their medications. You know, and uh, it's just kind of like, but the tradition is, you know, if you, go, you follow the American Diabetes Association, it's like 40 grams of carbohydrate per meal. Why don't you just take some and shoot them, you know? And it's just learning how to do the diet. But, you know, we also are interested in selling medications if you watch the Weather Channel, you're going to see every new diabetes medicine that they're making tons of money off of, and 80% of diabetics don't need it. Some are too far along to totally, you know, you always have a little bit of insulin. But let's go to the next one. And then the other I want to talk about is Alzheimer's. Uh, again, when I was growing up, dementia, an old person with dementia was fairly rare. You never really heard of Alzheimer's. But it's so now, but I can tell you, this is a case report of the first group of 10 patients that have had uh, Alzheimer's reversed. So why do you get Alzheimer's? Insulin resistance, and you're, I know it sounds like a broken record, but you know, you damage your liver, your insulin's high, your brain cells, your brain burns glucose. It doesn't have to burn glucose if you're keto adapted. We've been told that the grain, the brain is a glucose-dependent organ, but it is not. Uh, once you're keto-adapted, fasting for four or five days, whatever, your brain gets the program to burn fat, and it really doesn't need glucose. And this was proven, too, back in the 70s. There's a guy named George Cahill, who's the uh, 
who is a professor at Harvard who is the world's expert on starvation in humans. He had a group of patients being studied. They didn't publish this. It's in his textbook. They didn't publish anything because they decided it was unethical. But what he did was they had been fasting for a couple of weeks. So they are really in a good fasting state. Their beta-hydroxybutyrate was on up there about five, which the brain can use for energy. And so uh, he put an insulin drip in them. Their blood sugar when their fasting was down around 70. You always have some sugar because your liver can make glucose. And he put an insulin drip in them. Uh, and over 24 hours, he drove their insulin down, I mean their blood glucose level down below 25, essentially zero. If any of your blood sugar went to 25 right now, you know, we'd be calling 911, you'd be, you'd be out on the floor, gone. These people sitting there talking just fine. They're in a fasting state, they're burning beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, they simply didn't need the glucose. But under normal conditions of eating carbohydrate like we do, sugar and all the starch that we do, your brain burns glucose. If you get insulin receptor, insulin receptor resistance in your brain, you start starving your brain for energy. This is the thing that causes the protein, it's a little complex, but causes the protein damage, the accumulation of the amyloid and all these kinds of things. They know you can look at someone and go do a PET scan on their brain right now and those that will get Alzheimer's have lower utilization of glucose in their brain than is normal. So really what happens to cause the Alzheimer's is, and that's why you'll hear some doctors, and I see it on TV, they will tell you that Alzheimer's is stage three diabetes. It's just insulin resistance in your brain cells. So what they basically did with these people, and they use whatever medications, but there is no, not going to be a pill that takes care of Alzheimer's because it's a lifetime of overconsumption of sugar and starch and the insulin resistance that has caused it. So in this program, what they did was restrict their carbohydrate intake to the low carb vegetables, uh, did some other things and a lot of MCT oils. They use coconut oil is 60% MCT oil. MCT oil is just medium chain triglycerides, which convert into beta hydroxybutyrate very quickly and efficiently to fuel the body. So uh, I put it in coffee in the morning along with heavy cream, these things. So it's the bottle we get from a thing called Bulletproof uh, coffee is uh, called brain octane reason. But basically it rapidly and quickly converts. That's why they like coconut oil and that kind of stuff. MCT oils, adequate rest, a whole program of that. But nine of the 10 who had had to stop work because of memory and all the symptoms of Alzheimer's went back to work normal functioning, as Dale Bredesen at UCLA. So that's easy to do. And then finally, uh, I want to tell you how to cure cancer. And while we don't know how to cure cancer, while we spent all these billions of dollars or millions or whatever it is in research and we don't really have a cure for cancer now, but we really do know how to cure cancer and it's changing rapidly in the last four or five years. As I said, these things happen. And what happens in medicine is uh, a lot of times you will have two competing theories about something. You know, it was a low fat sugar thing. Back in the 60s and 70s, there was a group of doctors led by a guy named Yudkin in London who knew sugar was the real problem, that natural fats, which humans have been eating for thousands and thousands of years, wasn't the source of disease, but in food industry influences and stuff. Anyway, they lost, we went down the low fat thing and y'all know the results. Well, in cancer, uh, there's a guy named Otto Warburg who won the Nobel Prize in 1931 because he described that cancer cells ferment glucose for energy. Now, fermenting glucose, sort of like making alcohol or fermenting alcohol, is a very inefficient way of producing energy. You oxidatively burn glucose. One glucose molecule going into your mitochondria, which is your little energy unit in your cell, will produce 24 ATP, that's the energy adenine triphosphate, that's the energy unit that makes things go. One glucose molecule oxidate, I mean fermented, will produce only two. So it's an old, inefficient form, but you retain the ability to do this. So if all of y'all decided, I'm gonna go out and jog 15 miles this afternoon, I suspect the majority of you the next morning could hardly move your legs. That's because you exceeded your oxidative capacity to produce energy. 
and you started fermenting glucose as a backup source of energy and you accumulated lactic acid. And that's why your legs are so sore the next morning. So one of the things he noted in 1926 was that uh, all cancer cells ferment glucose for energy, which normal cells would not do unless under extreme, extreme stress. So he called it that ultimately cancer is a metabolic disease. So basically what he was saying is, your mitochondria that oxidatively burns glucose is damaged. Then your cell has to resort to fermenting glucose. So cancer is actually caused by metabolic damage. The competing theory was you could look under the microscope and they knew chemicals and all these things that cause cancer. And they could see all this damage in the DNA. And so the standard therapy that became accepted was called somatic mutation theory that chemicals, carcinogens, damage your DNA, releasing these oncogenes and these cancers, and you've all heard about genetic treatment for cancers and blah, blah, blah. The problem was Warburg was right, but we went down the wrong path. So, and really what really triggered it, there were doctors, as Dr. Peterson at Johns Hopkins that studied metabolic theories for years, a guy named Seafried at Boston College, and more about. So the study hadn't stopped, it just was the uh, relegated to the background or those quacks that hadn't accepted what the truth is. But 2007 was kind of a watershed because that's when the uh, genomic atlas of cancer came out. So if your somatic mutation theory was correct, the, uh, uh, say, Jane Doe has a infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast, and Jane Doe number two over here has the same tumor. The idea was the genetic mutations would be the, uh, the same, and we can atlas these and determine how to treat cancers. Didn't work out that way. Everybody's tumor has different genetic damages. And not only that, within the same tumor, there are different genetic damages. So there's different cells have different DNA damage and all, which basically said something else was going on which made people start turning to the metabolic theory that uh, Peterson at Johns Hopkins had been working on in, in obscurity for 30 years. So, truth is, metabolic damage, probably from sugar and insulin and insulin resistant, damage your mitochondria. The mitochondria, and actually they figured out how cancers become immortal, and this is, this is what happens. So fascinating, y'all might not want this much science, but I, I find it really fascinating. So, chemicals can, oxidative stress from insulin resistance to your mitochondria damages your mitochondria. Your mitochondria sends out epigenetic signals to the nucleus, and this is what activates these oncogenes and this kind of stuff, because the mitochondria is panicking and running to die. You know, sends out this, and it upregulates the production of an enzyme called hexokinase 2. And on your mitochondria are these little uh, proteins called voltage-dependent anion channels. They're there because God gave you a way to prevent cancers. If the mitochondria gets damaged enough, the voltage-dependent anion channels come, and that releases a, basically a poison from the line of the mitochondria and traps cytochrome C in the mitochondria, and that's apoptosis or cells, because they tell you, you know, a lot of cancer cells develop, they're supposed to die before they don't. But if the H hexokinase 2 gets high enough, which you need hexokinase 2 to make to ferment glucose, it attaches to the voltage-dependent anion channels and prevents them from closing, making the cell immortal. And that's why you have the metastatic and the at cancers and everything. So they have developed ways now to uh, to affect this uh, fermentation of sugar. And what's coming down the pike is a uh, just a drug, and this is a real problem, it'll take a while to get through it, called 3 bromopyruvate. Pyruvate's one of the steps in fermenting sugar. And so Dr. Peterson and his associates at Johns Hopkins back in the early 2004 or 5, they thought 3 bromopyruvate would probably kill the animals because they had, at that time, I think it was mice with these huge liver tumors and metastatic liver disease. But they gave it to them and they're perfectly fine and doing fine and the cancers all went away. It turned out that 
the lactic acid was actually the cheese because you don't make much lactic acid, you don't have lactic acid channels. The 3-bromopruvate goes through the lactic acid channels which can refuse, so it can kill cancer cells selectively without damaging normal cells, and the human trials have started in Arizona in the past uh, year or so. But back to nutritional treatment of cancer, and this is something you can talk to people about, and I'll give you a website to talk to, or talk to your, because you all know someone with cancer. Well, if cancers have to ferment glucose for energy, they lose the ability to burn fat. You know, well, if you're keto adapted, if you're on very high fat, very low carbohydrate diet, your blood sugar is going down into the 60s or 70s, it's so naturally, you're basically starving the cancer. And it's interesting the treatment you want to do, uh, which we're going to start, and I, mean, I can spread up for it, offering to people, cancer patients. You get diagnosed with a cancer and you're going into chemotherapy. These that are doing this, and it's in studies, and some people do on their own, a lot of people do, is what they would do to treat cancer with the nutrition and the diet and, and getting them on the very high fat, very low carbohydrate diet is they do some special things with it. You would start, when you start chemo, by fasting for four or five days because that really stresses the cancer. Because when you fast, obviously your beta-hydroxybutyrate, all your normal cells can burn beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and your blood sugar goes way down and then you're hitting it with chemo. And so you're stressing the cancer a lot more. And they continue the ketogenic diet with some caveats. I did it, and I, like Stefanson, and I've done it for four years, I really didn't care how many calories I ate. You know, I was just interested in the weight loss. So it really doesn't matter. But if you're interested in starving cancer cells, you restrict the calories too, to uh, around 1,200 calories. And you always continue intermittent fasting with them. So you'll fast them two days a week. You restrict their calories. 80 plus percent of everything they're eating is fat. And you can really affect uh, this. And so on the right, and <laughs> you know what really says to that is, is we've known this for years. On the right is a report from a Dr. Nebling. She's a nutritionist. This was her PhD project. It's a report of two little girls in 1995. The ketogenic diet, there's a thing called the Charlie Foundation. It's used to treat children with seizures because the brain loves fat to burn, and it burns it more efficiently than sugar, and it can heal itself because of the increased energy gets into it. So children with intractable seizures... <laughs> This is funny, too, because this was actually discovered back in the 20s and done then, and they were preachers <laughs> who, <laughs> the parents come to this doctor at Mayo or whatever and tells them, you know, really the, the preachers or the faith healers are much better at controlling my child's seizures than, than you are. And so uh, he goes out to the tent meetings, and there was one guy near Chicago that had a whole complex where people came to him for that. They are simply putting them on a water fast. When they put them on a water fast, go into ketosis, start burning fat for energy, your seizures go away. And so they were intermittently water fasting them, basically doing what we're talking about with cancer, and their seizures stayed away most of the time. And then that fell out of favor in the 30s when they uh, discovered Dilantin. But it came back into favor in the early 90s, a little guy named Charlie that his dad was a movie director, there's a made-for-TV movie called Do No Harm, but anyway. They got uh, John, uh, Baltimore, Johns Hopkins had, had a program in it, so they got the Charlie Foundation going, so it was being done a lot for children with intractable seizures instead of operating on their, their brain. So they knew this theory of cancer was in the background, and so what her PhD thesis was she had these two little girls who had astrocytomas of the brain. They think the ketogenic diet's best efficient at treating brain tumors, which the, the brain... Uh, can really utilize the beta-hydroxybutyrate well. But anyway, she put these children on a restricted calorie ketogenic diet. This is 1995. They had completed all their chemo, all their radiation. The parents had told they had uh, a year or two to live. Uh, and this is a four-year-old and a six-year-old, so you know that. So they put them on a restricted calorie ketogenic diet. She published her paper after a couple of years. They were both doing fine on it. Got her PhD and moved on, but they were at... Uh, uh, in Cleveland, uh, I spelled the last report that I can find in the literature, one of the little girls was lost to follow-up after 10 years, and the other little girl was alive and doing well after 15 years. It was only two years left. So 
It's sad that we knew this back in 95, but it can't get through, you know, the wrong theory is done, and it can't get, uh, get through to people. But you know about it now. Uh, so, any questions about all this? I'm pretty monotonous on Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, mine's mean. probably that way right now because today's my fasting day, so I <laughs> Yeah. Given to me chemicals to use the bathroom, mm -hmm. but I was supposed to be doing, you know, the other thing. Is that, is that normal? Uh, unusual. Uh, obviously, Stefanson lives on a year like this. The Eskimos lived on the ice for 3,000 years. What I do is, you know, magnesium is something, and so I take uh, a teaspoon of milk magnesia every night along with a magnesium pill seems to work fine for me, but there are little things like that that you have to do. So let me tell you a little bit about the diet because there's so much information out there now. Uh, this is what pro athletes do. If you will Google LeBron James diet, I don't know if you keep up with LeBron James, probably not, but you know, big basketball player. So he keto adapted uh, a year or so ago, slimmed down, lost all this pain, and then won the NBA championship last year. Djokovic, the tennis player, all of these ultra marathon runners. Because think about it from an athlete's standpoint. When you've gone through this genetic process, which takes two or three weeks, and, and during that first two or three weeks, since your genes are reprogramming themselves to primarily burn fat, a lot of people have what they call a low carb flu or they feel bad, this type of thing. And that's because your kidney starts secreting salt. That's one of the reasons you lose weight uh, so, uh, so rapidly first. So we just put people on chicken broth, salty chicken broth, cup a day, two cups a day for the first two to three weeks to maintain your salt. But once you've done that from an athlete's standpoint, uh, one, when your brain's burning beta-hydroxybutyrate, you tolerate concussive injury to your brain much better. That's why the NCAA, that's why I think all football players will either be uh, getting MCT oils or be on a ketogenic diet. The Navy, came to a Dr. D'Agostino of South Florida because they were interested in this for Navy SEALs. So Navy SEALs use rebreathers, which is 100% oxygen. You get below 50 feet, you start getting the disorientation in the brain from the 100% oxygen. But if you're keto adapted, you can go much, much deeper. And apparently, you know, at 50 feet, a 50 caliber machine gun can kill you. So this was a major interest for them. They were interested in ways of uh, developing ketone salts like they could give these guys injections and have them have the ketones there while they're on their mission and, and then they're studying that. But in, if you get uh, brain trauma, one of the big things about brain trauma is you can't utilize glucose well and you get a lot more permanent damage, but you can utilize beta-hydroxybutyrate. What it really comes down to is God designed you to live on fat. Everything in your genes is programmed to stay in as good a health as possible. But we do the diet, unlike Stefanson, uh, basically it's uh, this. I eat meat, chicken, fish, seafood in normal small portions, four ounce, six ounce. Stefanson was eating 115 grams of protein, and that's about uh, a pound and a half of meat. So it's not really a meat diet. Too much protein requires insulin. The insulin takes you out of ketosis. So really when you're treating medical things like these children with seizures, you have to limit protein tell women 60 to 80 grams of protein and men under 100 grams of protein. So these protein shakes and protein power plan, uh, you just don't want too much protein because it's like a low acting carbohydrate and you keep your carbs under 50 grams, but it varies on how much. But it's just a different way of cooking and it's just, just, just normal food. 
You eat a little bit of meat, chicken, fish, seafood, and the normal portions. And you eat the low-carb vegetables, always made with lots of fat, peppers, onion, mushrooms, green beans. You just do things in a different way. So I fry chicken, you know, take a bag of pork skins, put them in the food processor, make your flour, and then dip your chicken in egg, cover it in pork skins, and fry it in the coconut or peanut oil, or we fry it in our lard since we make lard. Uh, and there's just a lot of little tricks, things like there. So many things now, because so many athletes do this, uh, called fat bombs, and you can, you can make these smoothies and everything that are, that are mostly fat. And what you find is, even though you can eat all the calories you want, you don't eat that much. I mean, you try this if you're used to having a bowl of cereal or something for breakfast. You know, try, try two good pieces of sausage and scrambled eggs. You know, put a good two or three tablespoons of heavy cream in your eggs, break them up, scramble them in the morning, two pieces of sausage. See if you get hungry before lunchtime. Not going to at all. It just takes a little bit for people to lose their uh, fear of fats. But you can reverse diabetes. You can stop Alzheimer's developing and getting off the sugar and the starch. So I don't eat potatoes, rice bread, and pasta cereals. Uh, you know, and obviously I don't use sugar. <laughs> I don't think anybody that knows much about this uses any sugar. It's just, a, you know, it's, a, it's a, in all the processed foods, so you get rid of the, the processed foods and that type of thing. Any other question? In your view, uh, how many days and how big should one fast to detox the human body? I do two days a week. I do an 18-hour fast, and I've been doing a 24-hour. I probably should do a 36-hour fast. Now, when you're medically fasting like that, because what you're doing is, the fasting, you know, lots of cultures have more carbohydrates and are not going to be in ketosis. The Plains Indians were, the Maasai, the Eskimo, there were a lot the healthiest people that were are what we call keto-adapted people. But other people, you know, they're all religions use fasting. And uh, it takes you about 11 hours to get into ketosis, to burn up the stored carbohydrate that you have. So... Uh, Tuesdays I've been doing, I've been doing this since Christmas, since reading all the medical stuff on it, because I'd always, church-wise, and hoo-pooed uh, fasting, which was wrong, of course, but anyway, so you really, uh, I do an 18-hour fast, so supper one night, and don't eat between, after, say, 6 o'clock at night, I have coffee, you can have, on the fast to get in ketosis, you can have coffee, a little bit of heavy cream in it, if you like, like cream, or just plain black coffee. You can have bone broths, which bone broth is one of the most healing things you do, and you can make bone broths easy by just getting the bones and it's just a little vinegar and a little water and put them in your crock pot and make bone broths. We have a freezer full of them, so that, to use in all of our soups and everything because it leaches all that nutrition out of the bones, which are very nutritious. So you can have bone broth, you can have plain tea, unsweetened tea, everything, and all the water you want to drink. So I find everybody thinks that fasting would be hard, but it's like right now. You know, I haven't eaten since last night, except for the coffee this morning, because I had, I had to go pick up processed pigs in Russellville this morning. I've been going since 6. And, uh, but I don't feel hungry at all. You, you don't really, it's really not that hard to do. And I would, you know, depending on your disease state, if you're good and healthy, I'd certainly do uh, 18 and 24 hour fast, so I won't eat till supper time tonight. But people are sick. I'd do a 36-hour fast every week and maybe an 18 or 24-hour one other day of the week. And that's something you can tell your people in your church how, uh, how healthy it is for them. We're we out of time? What about apple cider vinegar? Is that as great as everybody says it is? Uh, a lot of old people used it because of the acid and age digestion. I think it's good for you. I don't think it's harmful. Forty-four percent fructose. <laughs> so, you know, honey, which humans still had very little access to, but loved because of the sugar in it. But you, you think back in those days, the average Israelite's not going to get much honey, or it's used as a medicine. Like I have a lot of people buy. We make honey on our do honey on our farm, and they'll take a teaspoon or a tablespoon every day. All right. So, before we quit, have I got any more time, or am I out? Okay. Well, but if you've got a burning question, now's the time, Dr. Wood. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to tell you how to reverse global warming, heal the planet, okay? <laughs> Since I'm a farmer, 
and I do this, I want to give you some stuff. We're meant to meet animals, which means God designed our world for us to eat animals, which he designed it for us to be able to produce the animals we need to eat. And the only way to feed the race, one of the major causes of, of uh, global warming, is not the burning of carbon. I would say that we produced as much carbon in the, here uh, a thousand years ago as we do today. A thousand years ago, it was a thing called the uh, long pine, long leaf pine forest. It stretched from Virginia to Texas. It was 91 million acres. If you look at pictures of it, it's these beautiful, like, almost like redwoods, long leaf pine that are all cut away except for a few of them now. And underneath it is huge grasslands that were clear. It burned, like in the West, natural burning. Lightning in August would strike fires. The longleaf pine adapted to fire. About 15 million acres a year burned, which produces as much carbon as all of our cars and all that, but we didn't have global warming, you know. Y'all need to go to YouTube, put in Alan Savory, and watch uh, his uh, talk. This is the problem we have with global warming. I, I know y'all didn't ask for this, but <laughs> I've got a pet peeve about it. Is not... 75% of the earth's land is desertifying and turning into the desert. And the only way to produce food on that land is through uh, livestock. And when the, you look that from Alan Savory, who's a biologist from Tanzania, he'll show you and go through that. I wanted to show you what livestock can do. This is Mexico. This is a ranch in Mexico. It's 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, a few cows open range like they used to do, and everyone's always told you all this desertification comes from overgrazing. All of you know that. All the scientists know that, you know. So what they did is they increased the cattle 400% and they mimicked nature. The way our environment developed for us was huge herds of herbivores. In the western U.S., the buffalo, the, the water buffalo, the, the zebra, all of these you see in Africa, huge herds of of these animals surrounded by ferocious predators. So the only protection they had was to bunch together, the protection of the herd, and then they dung and poop and pee all over their food. So they've got to move all the time. So this holistic management we do is this. So they put four, about four times as many cattle on this, bunched them in holistic grazing, and this is the same land 10 years later. You know. So what I wanted to tell you is this. The row crops and the grain diet <laughs> is the major driver of, of global warming. This is from a Dr. Hicks at University of Georgia. There are 22 million acres of row crops in the southeastern United States. They sequester almost no carbon. What little bit that goes into the plant is destroyed at the end of the year. The key to our environment and the global warming is the soil. When, when cows, our cows are grouped together and they eat a place down and they move the next day and it's 50 to 60 days before they come back to that spot. This grass has developed a human, uh, a huge root system with bacteria and fungi that sequester carbon. And this is the data. When Dr. Hickson published this, no one believed him, but if you took just 10% of that row crop land, 22.2 million acres, and put 2.2 million cows, sheep, or goats on it, whatever you want, and holistically managed it, bunching them together and moving it, the root system that would develop, it would sequester 4.5 teragrams of carbon a year. That's the amount produced by 4,332 coal-fired steam plants, and there's only 1,300 in the United States. Okay. That's the amount of carbon produced by 3.47 billion cars. And that's just 10% into holistic management of animals. And those other lands that are going bad, the only way we can heal those lands, like I showed you that picture in Mexico, is with livestock, like I said, whether it's sheep. And you've got to bunch them and herd them together, the herds, to, to do that. So some interesting websites. You've heard my pet peeve about farming, and that's about it that I have.